Hello and welcome to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. I am Andy Green. I'm Felix. Exceptional audio levels, Schultz. It's unnecessary information for the listener, Felix. But what is necessary information is uh, today's guest, Max Buser from MBNF. What does it stand for? Max Buser and Friends. There's a lot of confidence. Oh, Freud. <laughs> a lot of a lot of confidence there. I'd say after this chat, we are definitely friends with Mr. Buser. Ah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't me know, certainly. Like... <laughs> Committed wow. to naming a product after me. So oh, hang, yeah, that's hang true. Out for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, he he had a very sketchy timeline on that. So mm, he kind of gave it a decade to, to yeah, sort it out. Yeah, next year, fine. mate. Next year. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll he get he said ten day. years. He said ten years. So, but like, good things take time. It's an anniversary piece. Like they're, they're celebrating a lot of ten year ten year releases this year. So I wouldn't be surprised if he timed it with the sort of the the ten year anniversary of this episode going live. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Mm. Like Watches and Wonders twenty thirty one. Mm. Uh, which will be held on the moon, <laughs> Mars probably, and and it's going to be like a tiny replica of the moon that plays music. I don't know. It's going to be amazing. Um, do you know what else was amazing, Andy Green? What's that? I it was amazing that I got to see a show at the Melbourne Rising Festival mm-hmm. hours before uh, you know the latest lockdown was announced, which is. You know, not great. Not amazing. No, it's not amazing. But what was good was uh, the Patricia Piccinini show that I attended, thanks to Hublot, because of course everyone knows that Hublot loves art. They great. do love art. They do mm-hmm. love art. They got a like, uh, you know, it's a uh, not not like a, a shallow marketing exercise. They have some legitimately cool artist collaborative pieces, like mm. uh, the Orlinskis, the. Uh, Sang Blur. The Sang Blur ones, the Shepherd Fairy. They don't yet have a collaborative piece with Patricia Piccinini. Are you familiar with Patricia Piccinini? I, I am after looking at your Instagram stories. Yeah, I just like saying the name Patricia Piccinini several times. Um, so this is, she's an Australian artist and she's probably mm. one of our most significant modern artists, like working in the late 90s to today. Mm-hmm. Uh, big themes in her work are sort of hyper-realism and the grotesque. Uh, and she looks at relationships between things. You might have, if you're not familiar with her, you've definitely seen her weird sort of very realistic sculptures of very odd, slightly weird creatures, like a, yep. maybe a human mixed with a fox with, uh, you know, several eyes coming out of its face. Mm-hmm. That sort of stuff. And... It's quite confronting and quite beautiful, but what really made the show for me was where it was held in Melbourne, the major train station. It's called Flinders Street. It's a big old building, and it's the sort of place that, you know, you, you, if you commute or work in the city, you go there every day of your life and you just, you know, you go from A to B. But there's this whole bit upstairs that, you know, hasn't been used, I'm going to say, since the 50s or 60s in any real way. That was like this abandoned. Uh, there's a, there's an old ballroom up there. There's an old library up there, and it's really sort of decrepit and wild, and really awesome place to have some contemporary art. Sounds like you're seeing decrepit, uh, grotesque relationships. <laughs> <laughs> it's us. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> and uh, welcome to this episode of OT the podcast, Couple Therapy. <laughs> So anyone, anyone who knows Melbourne knows Flinders Street, so yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's the ballroom up there. Is, it's amazing. Like, it's a really, really cool space, and it was really, really special. So thanks to Hublot for making that happen, uh, even if... Oh, and it was on the night of a bloody eclipse as well. How's that for, you know... They know how to pick it. Yeah. Yeah. What have you been up to, mate? Well, speaking of eclipse, I've been getting jazzed for this Friends reunion uh, special on uh, on Binge, which I know you've already watched, but... I've only watched the trailer, so don't uh, don't spoil it. But I noticed Jen Aniston wearing a uh, a yellow gold Rolex, which I think you think is a day date. I think it's probably a gold date. Just oh, fighting words. Ben Klein's mm, got to yeah, pull, so pull the episode. He's probably DMing me right now. Um, yeah, we're ready to square up. No, I, Jen Aniston. I only say, and I'll, look, I'll I'll ask Jen um, just to confirm because <laughs> it's the only way to really know. I'll ask Gunter. <laughs> um, but I've like I've seen her wear a gold date just, which you know does look a lot like a day date minus the day of the week, uh, quite a bit in the past. Sure. And it got me uh, got me looking down the the path of what watches Jennifer Aniston wears. Did you go to uh, our friend Nicolai's Instagram account because he's probably all all across that? 
I didn't see any. I just poked around her Instagram, and the first one that jumped out at me was actually a, a show part. Um, it turns out she's got a bit of a show part theme going on. Yeah. But it was a show part Alpine Eagle with the uh, what looked like the blue dial in the full gold. The chrono or the, the other one? The, no, the just like time the time only one they did. Oh, cool. Full gold. Yeah. At first, at, at first I thought AP. I oh, know it's a Hublet. No, it's the, it's the show part, um, right. which so, is pretty cool. Do we think that's a... Um... Uh, a commercial relationship, you reckon? Well, then I well, then I kind of tell, well, sure. then I did some more digging. And it looks like she's been been wearing a few show parts on the morning show, or the morning wars in other parts. Sorry, of the, the morning wars. Yeah, no, it's the morning show everywhere else. But because we actually have a TV show called the Morning Show uh, in Australia, it's the morning wars. Well, we've got an international audience, so oh, the morning no. show <laughs> slash wars, <laughs> an excellent show that you should definitely watch. Yeah, so. Turns out her stylist hooked up a few watches for that, which is also mm-hmm. quite interesting. Um, but it just stood out because she was wearing it over her knit, so like a bit of a statement. Yep. Uh, cool and then, cool look. Uh, yeah, then I would start looking at like 1990s Jennifer Aniston, and you know she's wearing stuff like Tatia Roadsters and and whatnot, just being yep. uh, an absolute star. So yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty good reunion. I mean, you know, there's some there's some lols, there's some weird, very weird moments, but you know, um, oh, you know. Not to not to give away major spoilers, but Cara Delevingne wearing a armadillo. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, am I allowed to uh, am I allowed to plug plug my new project, Felix? No. no. Okay. Go. Just insert a separate recording here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're editing it, so it's just yeah. you doing. It. <laughs> What's your new project? Well, Is I got to tell you, I'm starting a new podcast. Oh. Yeah. Awkward. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know how you feel about this. So I don't think I've even asked. No, it's it's uh, it's primarily country music. It's called Smashville. Um, so James McVeigh from The Vamps and I are mm. kind of setting it up together and we're going to be speaking to a whole bunch of different artists sort of that overlap into that country music scene. Yeah, right. So are you uh, a secret country music uh, guru? It's not a, it's I'm not a guru and it's it's not a secret that I that I quite like country music. Yeah. I think I think we had a great chat with um Cat and Catlin from 10 and 2. Oh yeah, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Is Keith. she on? Is she the the, the debut imagine? Just that. Um no, we have, we've we've got some good guests lined up. Obviously, you know James is um is pretty well known in the music scene, so he's yeah. been able to send some send some DMs and line up some pretty exciting people. That's awesome. So, well, yeah, right. And you're going to sort of like be exploring the world of country in a you know a friendly, non threatening way for for people that don't know their banjos from their mandolins. What's it about? What what makes this? Uh, what makes Smashville stand out? All right, so we're going to be having some really good access to um, to musicians, and they're not just going to be country musicians either, Felix. So there's going to be people that have you know worked in the scene. There's going to be like that overlap, so like country pop, country yeah. rock, yeah. country rap, country um, metal, country metal. But yeah, Keith, Dolly, I think they're all booked for season two. So we'll see how we go nice. with season one. But those um, those top tier names are certainly going to be going to be discussed. So yeah, Smashville Pod on Instagram, and and we might drop a link to the in the show notes to this guy. And rest yeah, assured, definitely. Felix, OT will continue. Um, we might even get some some watch chat from some of these guys that we've got lined up because a lot of them are you know into watches as well. Yeah, I'm trying to come up with like what your new bio is going to be. Is it like going to be uh, watches and banjos? Yeah, sure. Nice. Uh, <laughs> hey, speaking of watches, Andy, we what? should probably have a chat about some new watches. Let's do it. This week, we're pleased to have the wonderful Nomos Glashute as our sponsors. The German brand has released some lovely new watches this year. Felix, let's have a chat about them. Andy, that sounds like a plan. Top line, we're talking about four major new releases. The Metro Neomatic 41 update the Tangente 41 update with a blue dial, the latest mm. instalment in the Doctors Without Borders watches, the Tangente 50 years, and the club campus in, of course, Future Orange and Absolute Grey. Plenty to talk about then. Sounds great. Let's uh, let's start by taking a trip with the Metro. Absolutely. So this is probably one of their sort of more major new releases. The Metro is a watch that was first unveiled in 2014. And as a design, it sort of sits somewhere between casual and dressy. Like mm. prior to that, Nomos was all, all about the, you know, the more sort of formal watches. And this, I think, signaled more of a shift into newer designs, codes, and, you know, a bit more of a relaxed energy and you know certainly with this one it's got a white dial but it's also got a gray fabric strap which is casual but the major story here andy is the movement Mm -hmm. it's the duw6101 which was from 2018 
and it is a date. It's an update, in fact. And can you spot it on the dial? Is it the date display? Yeah, but it's not. It's not like an ugly window number, no. you know, eating into the the dial. It's a little radial, uh, right, sort of at the outer edge of the mm. dial. It's a, you know, two brightly coloured pips that sort of flank the current date. So if you look at the the picture on our screen, I think it's on the third of the month. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that is really cool. And super luminova as well, right? Uh, on the date, I think. Yeah, the date. Yep. Just in case you want to read in the read in the dark what the date is, I guess you could do that. Uh, good size though as well, forty one millimeters. What do you reckon? I think it's gorgeous. I uh, I really like it. And sort of being Nomos, they've used different color schemes for the for the different sort of indicator of the date. You know, obviously there are a few different neomatics in the um, in the forty one. So I think it's a really clever update. Yeah, cool. And pricing on this one is from six thousand two hundred thirty Australian dollars. It's a little bit more if you want to get it on a, a metal bracelet or something like that. What's next, Andy? Bargain. Well, Tangente, Neomatic 41 update, Midnight Blue. So very similar to what you've just discussed, Felix, but this mm. I feel is where you really see the date display kind of come through. The, there's there's a bit of layer to the dial. Yeah, it's hard to miss because you've got a sort of a that Midnight Blue dial with bright green, super luminova, cleverly used as the indicator. Yeah, it's a wild green. Yeah, it's just, it's it really does, We I hate to say it, but it pops um, on the against the against the navy blue and it, it sort of adds this depth to the dial because it is like an outer ring but it's sort of yeah it, it just adds a whole you know you know new texture to the to the um to the blue i guess it's like a sandwich construction so yeah there's some literal depth of there yeah sandwich vibes um yeah. so yeah aside from that um it's it you know it sits alongside the the silver and the ruthenium R- i never Ruthenium? know it's sort of a dark brownie gray sort of color i think Mm, um, you know, standard movement, slim as 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 the others of you just mentioned. Um, you know, genuine in-house movement. Price from fifty-seven hundred Aussie dollars, which is uh, which is a bargain. What do you think? Yeah, oh, look, I love it. Uh, so it's the the tangente is a pretty sort of formal design. It's got those classic uh, lugs that that Nomos is. I think it's probably Nomos's most popular watch. Mm. But this shows that it can be you know with that dark dial and that green highlight. Again, it's a, a different side of the personality there. That I can get behind. What's next? Uh, another tangente. Why? Cool. Why mess with a good thing, Andy? Um, this one is a little simpler in execution, mm-hmm. but it's also supporting a worthy cause. Uh, it's the tangente thirty-eight fifty years of Doctors Without Borders. So for the last ten years, Nomos has been collaborating with uh, Medicine Sans Frontières uh, to release limited editions. You know, where it's a, a portion of the the watch supports that organization. This year happens to coincide with the 50th anniversary of uh, MCF. Mm-hmm. And you can read, if you can zoom in to, on the, the bottom of the text where it normally says made in Germany, mm-hmm. it's got a, you know, 50 years of uh, Doctors Without Borders script, which is a nice little touch. The other thing you can always tell these watches apart from the regular tangentes is there's a red 12, which is mm, a, very cool. a pretty special thing in watchmaking and fairly interesting to Nomos. What do you think about this one, Andy? Yeah, love it. Love it. Uh, a great cause. As you mentioned, 100 euro from every watch. Um, yeah, being an LE does go to uh, MCF. I think that the size is also really interesting. So it's called the 38, but it's it comes in at, uh, what, 37.5, which... I mean, round it up. Yeah, we round up. I like it. It's very uh, pragmatic to round it up. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, with that great sort of textile strap that it comes on, I think it really works. It is well sized, well priced. Really, that's a winner. And the, yeah, so the price is two thousand eight hundred and ten Aussie dollars. Uh, thanks largely to you know that manual wound Alpha Caliber keeping mm. the the value proposition tight. And this, interestingly enough, it's a big edition. So there's two thousand two hundred twenty one watches, and it's the first time this is available worldwide. Well, we got to you know raise money for a good cause, so I'm uh, I'm okay mm. with that. Next uh, up. Yeah, what's next? <laughs> next up, we've saved the best until last, in my opinion. The New Be Club cool. Campus. Be cool. New Club Campus, Future Orange and Absolute Grey. So two sizes, two dials. Um, one's orange, T- one's grey. Total uh, of four watches. <laughs> total of four watches. Did my maths correctly there? 36 mil, 38 mil. So... Oh, look, that orange dial is, you know, future orange is hard to miss. It is just killer. Um, I I don't know which I would choose from the 36 or the 38, uh, but probably the 38. Would I'd, you, I'd would you go orange? Yeah, I think I'd, you'd have to go orange. 
Okay. Yeah, well, because I think you, you look at the orange and it's hard to miss, but the grey is no slouch either. So, mm. like, it's it's an, it's called absolute grey. Of course, uh, 2021 grey is the colour of the year, according to Pantone. Mm-hmm. And it goes well with a grey strap. But it's not just a grey dial. There is, like, hot highlights on mm. that sort of, uh, what is it? It's a California dial layout. Yeah. Um, you know, around those those luminous numerals, there's like a, a bright orange print, and there's a the sub second hand is also pretty pretty hard to miss. Like, I understand not everyone's going to want that you know bright orange watch, but there's still plenty of visual excitement with the grey one too. Yeah, I think the grey is a, a, a stunner, and I think next to each other they look really really good. Like Get a it's, pair. it's honestly these should be sold as a pair. It should be the only way that they're sold. I like, really like them. You know, 1,870 Aussie for the smaller one, that's mm. two top-notch watches for just over $3,000, $3,500. $4,000 and <laughs> nearly. But, but okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm assuming that you've got a good relationship with your authorised dealer. And no. You can... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's eighteen seventy Aussie dollars for the 36 mil or in the future orange or the absolute grey. And for the 38 mil in the same dials, it's 2,060 Australian dollars. So a really, really amazing, um, you know, watch for for that and yeah i'm gonna before we get back to the show i want to put you on the spot andy Mm -hmm. one of these watches can be yours which one i think it's still the the club campus 38 future orange i really like what it represents we've talked about it uh talked about it before in the past but you know kind of looking to the the positivity of the of what the future holds i'm i can really get behind and i love the orange like it's just it's just bright it's like a smile on the wrist Oh, Andy. Andy, <laughs> marketing green. I'm going the uh, Metro Neomatic 41 update. I just, yeah, I can see that. Metro's a cool, I've always thought it's cool on that gray strap with that complication. Mm. I think it's a it's a killer combo. Yeah, I really want to see that date display. Well, find out, to find out more, visit nomos-glasute. That's nomos-glasute.com. You can buy all the watches on the site as well as maybe an online retailer like Mr. Porter or one of you know your local Australian authorized dealers say the hourglass or monarchs that's a great idea andy let's get back to the show okay that's that now let's move on to the next part of the show the one and only max Busser. let's do it Andy, today's guest is the man who makes up the M and B in M, B and F, Mr. Max Busa. He started his watchmaking career at JLC when he moved on to Harry Winston's rare timepieces, where he oversaw the critically acclaimed Opa series that allowed him to work with some of the most innovative independent watchmakers of the time. That uh, maybe light bulb moment led to him founding MBNF in 2005, a company that allowed him to continue collaborating while at the same time pushing the limits of what was horologically possible. Welcome to OT, Max Busa. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you to launch me every time I come on the stage. That was perfect. <laughs> well, basically, I, I just ripped it off your uh, about page and, and reworded it. So <laughs> between us, man. I'm practically a friend already. Uh, <laughs> that's what the, that's what the F stands for, Felix. There you go. Um, Max, can you tell us a little bit about uh, MBNF and what it stands for? MBNF. Okay, the, the, the brand name is short for Maximilian Busa and Friends. And, um, and as I've often related, uh, 16 years ago when I came out with the brand, everybody told me it's the worst name ever for a watch brand. I mean, you can't call a high-end, complicated watch brand and friends. And I said, honestly, I, I, what I'm trying to say is, and people who share the same values, enthusiasm, and, and that was a little bit too long to <laughs> abbreviate. So I, I did and friends. Um, at the end of the day, MBNF is, is a life decision. It's mm-hmm. a decision to be able to create what I believe in. While for 14 years, I was always creating at Jaeger Le Court, at Harry Winston watches, I thought people wanted because I thought that was what my bosses wanted me to do. And that's what was bringing money in. And I realized I'd basically sold out. I'd, um, I'd be, I'm sorry for all the marketeers out there. I'd become <laughs> a marketeer. And, um, and so I, I realized in a pretty critical psychotherapy session I was having about my dad passing away um, that I didn't want to, oh, well, let's say I needed to be proud the last day of my life and therefore I needed to create what I believe in and I needed mm-hmm. to abide in business as much and in my personal life by the same values my parents tried to teach me and 
And in my personal life, I was, but in, in work, in business, it was incredibly complicated because there's so many people who, because there's money or power involved, think it's normal to, excuse my English, screw you over. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I thought we accept so much stuff that we would never accept in our personal lives. And I didn't want that to happen anymore in my professional life. Hence the unfriends, because that's the only way I, I could actually abbreviate it. And uh, 2005, I um, resigned from Harry Winston. They all fell off their chairs. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I put all my savings into MBNF, which had one employee for the first two and a half years. That was me without a salary, <laughs> working from my flat in Geneva. And uh, in 2000 and mid 2007, we managed to come out and deliver the very first horological machine number one. So that's an abbreviated, ver abbreviated version, but th the story is actually much longer than that. Yeah, fantastic. What a, what a story. And, um, you know, I think we've, we've probably all heard sort of the more detailed version, but for those who haven't, we can kind of find it and link it up. Uh, how do you pick your friends? How do you pick these people that you collaborate with? I think of sort of Sapa Neva and Black Badger. There's, you know, probably half a do dozen others. Genuine question, how do you pick them? So originally, the first people who helped me create the, uh, the first MBNFs where, of course, people I'd worked with at Harry Winston. And uh, so it's all the, the subcontractors, suppliers, I mean, not all, but uh, part of them. And uh, people I'd worked with, like I typically, um, uh, Jean, um, what say, um, Peter Speakmarine, I'd created the tourbillon mm -hmm. with him at Harry Winston. Uh, Jean-Marc Widerest, we created all the retrogrades. So it, I started off in my comfort zone because that was how it was going to happen at the beginning. And then it just went on. The friends of my friends became my friends. And uh, the more you meet people, the more suddenly you connect. Uh, Black Badger, uh, James, I met at Salon QP one, I can't remember which year. Uh, he was, he'd created something for, what was it, Sh Sh Schofield watches. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and we started talking and we should do something together. Boom. Stepan Sarpaneva, I'd met, I don't know how many times and one day at Basel Fair. And that's why I regret that they're normal all these fairs because there were so many things happening during these events, which mm. were not about only selling. Um, I, I come out of our only office we had in those days at NBNF in our Basel Fair uh, booth, and uh, he's sitting there, and I go and say hello to him. Uh, I says, "How's life?" And he says, oh, "Good." And he looks at me and he says, "You need a moon." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like. Okay, you're probably right. I need a moon. <laughs> and that's how we started. I said, so what do you have in mind? He says, I have a few ideas. So, okay. And a week later, he sent me a sketch of what he had an idea. And that's the beginning of Moon Machine One. Um, that's, that's one of the many things I love in our industry when it's an artisan, small version of it, is human beings are so important. It's not about strategies. It's not about branding. It's about just meeting great human beings, sitting down, having a coffee and saying, why don't we do something together? And there's so many great products were created that way. It's, I, I, of course, I think that makes sense, you know, in that sort of creative collaborative way to have those sort of friends, you know, publicly celebrated. They're doing, you know, a very high profile and integral part of your watches, but you take it further than that. Um, the Swiss watch industry it's pretty, you know, it's like a case study in smoke and mirrors for a lot of people, I think. <laughs> uh, you you do it really differently. Like on your website, if you're if anyone's interested in they can find out, you know, who takes the photos, who writes the press releases, who supplies the, the crystals and the cases, all that stuff is really front and center. Why why would you want to do that and what what's in it for you? Because I had great parents. And then my parents taught me Amongst the many things they taught me was treat people the way you want to be treated. And I think we've all told our kids, if we have any kids, that. But you can just actually apply it in, in every sense of the word uh, in your personal life and your professional life. If mm -hmm. I was a subcontractor to a brand, I would love that brand to say, Mr. X did the sapphire crystals. Mr. Y did the hand finishing. Uh, Miss... Zed wrote the, um, the press release. I think that would be nice. And just treat people the way you want to be treated. Everything which my parents, as I said, tried to share with me about being good people, I've tried to apply at MBNF. And there is no marketing gizmo behind it. It's just trying to be a good person. On my dad's eulogy, I was able to say he was a good man. I hope one day somebody will say that of me. 
Oh, it's very, very touching, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sure they will. And it's, it's, it's really refreshing to see, you know, as you kind of mentioned, the reason for, for leaving Harry Winston is sort of being a little bit disheartened with the, the marketing and the, the, the selling your soul. So you're kind of doing the opposite and living and breathing it. What, uh, what we're curious about is sort of, you know, being in the independent watchmaking scene for, you know, 16 years now. How has it changed, uh, and, and what stayed the same for you? How has the scene changed, or what has changed for me? Well, I mean, both. What's a more interesting answer? Um, well, of course, for me. <laughs> Uh, for MBNF, so much has changed. I mean, at the beginning, we nearly went bankrupt. I mean, we would have taken two more weeks to deliver the first HM1 and we were bankrupt. I say we, I was really? bankrupt. There was nobody in the company. Uh, um, uh, it, it was incredibly complex. Uh, cash flow was incredibly tough. It always is. I mean, we're, we're insane creators. At the end of this year, we will have created, are you sitting down, 20 mm -hmm. calibers in 16 Whoa. years that is humongous and we're not talking of oh let's take that round caliber we've been doing for 50 years and add a power reserve indicator we're talking of completely different calibers in different sh functions shapes uh, performance everything mm. and um and so initially i think well i think the, f the first thing which is uh, it's a good question because i'm i'm sorry i'm blabbering while i'm thinking um initially i I was very angry. There was a lot of anger in me when I created the brand. It was angry, angry mm -hmm. against myself because I felt I'd sold out, angry against my industry, which had never been that successful, but um, had less and less creativity. And so um, there was some sort of a rebellion in this, and I had no idea where the hell I was going. When I launched MBNF, I had HM1 in mind, a design of HM2, and a vague sketch of HM3. And that was it. And a ridiculous business plan on an Excel spreadsheet, which actually never happened. And, um, and so it was all about jumping into the, the wild. Now, 20 calibers later, um, we're more structured. We're already 31 in the company. Uh, we've got five R&D engineers, research and development engineers, working on all sorts of different calibers internally. Well, before, initially, we were subcontracting everything because, of course, I don't have all talents by far, and I was all alone. Um, now, of course, for I mean, last oh, 14, 12 years, 14 years, I can't remember, we've, we've been assembling all our movements. Uh, we, of course, now we've got seven CNC machines, and we machine about 75% of our cases and 20 to 25% of all the components of all our movements internally. So there's been this integration of, of knowledge. There's also been the fact that initially, I think I was terrified that people wouldn't buy what I was going to do. Now mm -hmm. I'm terrified of disappointing. It's a completely different way of seeing things. As a creator, you create, like, think of HM4 Thunderbolt and <laughs> realize I was terrified that nobody would ever buy that now when i create something insane crazy which i'm not i'm actually not at all scared it's not going to sell um we've had some incredible years over the last years i mean we, we're doing we're on cloud number nine um mm -hmm. but now every time i come out with a piece i'm a little bit scared that people will go oh not as creative as before <laughs> so, yeah that's interesting um, so the the, the I think you need to be afraid to create. I think it's part, I mean, the adrenaline comes from taking risks. You, you go a, a week on holiday in the Maldives, you'll be very happy about it, but you're not going to be proud about it. You go and jump into a Norwegian fjord at four degrees in the middle of winter, and you're going to tell your grandchildren about it. You, mm. you get pride from taking risks. And as a creator, you need that adrenaline of taking risks. So if it's easy, is boring and and that's that's what i've discovered over the years is that the the adrenaline comes from different reasons but i need it to be there all the time fascinating and i think yeah you you know you, you've talked about risks and you've you sort of mentioned you know sort of skirting with bankruptcy early on um i suspect the fact that you've made you know more than one caliber a year then is it yes no, no, uh, it's even, even worse. I mean, I, I was <laughs> counting that in the last 10 years, we will have done 16. So that's, that's 1.6 per year. <laughs> that's, the last that's, years. Uh, I'm sure, that's you know, the, the, the MBNF friend that is the auditing and 
uh, financial services people say that the the investment required to sort of do that sort of R and D is a huge risk, uh, and it's amazing. So, yeah. So the first thing is, if you want to do what I've done, never have anybody in finance. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was funny because when I entered Diego Lecoult 30 years ago, and Henri John Belmont, the, the CEO, hired me and who was the man who was going to turn around the company, told me that the first person he fired when he entered the company was the, the finance director. And I had no idea. I just came out of university. I was looking at him. He's my mentor. I was like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. why? He said, because finance directors always stop you doing what you want to do. They always block any creative process because maybe it's not going to make enough money. And you can't build a brand by counting money. And uh, that stuck in me. Harry Winston... I more or less did the same thing when I took over sure. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, at some yeah. point when it was becoming bigger and bigger, I needed one, but he was a very pragmatic finance director. And, um, and so at MBNF, I've, I've never had anybody in finance and um, we've got accountants there, they're outsourced. And one of the many things I made to make my life easier is in 2013, the year my first daughter was born, I decided that we would not grow. And what's very complicated in a company financially is when you grow because your cash flow is yeah. just sucked up. Plus, when you create so many calibers, it's insanely complex. But when you don't grow, when you do the same revenue every year for the last eight years, um, even though the demand is much higher, you actually more or less know that every year this is how much you're allowed to, to spend. Now, having said that, creating a, a new caliber is incredibly capital intensive. And... Most people who want to launch a watch brand don't realize it. And I have to sit them down often and say, okay, look, the watch I'm wearing took four years to develop. So it's four years of negative cash flow. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, you'll be able to sell it for four years because the life cycles of products are getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. So let's say you manage to sell it for four years. Now, the first year you sell it, you're still in negative cash flow. So they all look at me like, how, how, how is that even possible? I'm like, because... I'm wearing my HM6 as we talk. Uh, HM6, we did 25 pieces a year over four years. The mm -hmm. first year, do you think we crafted 25 wheels? Of course not. Once you've <laughs> calibrated a machine which takes you about a, year, a day and a half to calibrate, you're going to produce 150 wheels because yep. you're going to do the whole series plus 50 more, which are going to be used for after-sales service for the next 50 years. Plus, of course, mm -hmm. there will be damage between the hand finishing, the plating, the assembly, etc., etc. So the first year, the, the sheer amount of components you have to machine are way more than the revenue you're going to make with the first 25 pieces. So you've got five years of negative cash flow, three years of positive. But that's all fine if you come out with one new movement every four or five years. We yep. come out with, as you said, one to two every year. So it's cumulated. Again, I have no idea how to read, um, uh, how do you say, a balance sheet. Sure. It's, it's insane, isn't it? I mean, I was a CEO of a company for seven years. I've owned my company for 16. I still don't know what, our, uh, uh, how do you say, créancier et débiteur. I, I, I just don't understand how it yeah, works. Yeah, the yeah. only thing I understand is a PL. and yep. You mm -hmm. need to make a certain revenue. You take out everything which are your costs. And if you're lucky, there's something at the end of the day. And that's called a profit. And, um, and so, yeah, we've, we've basically piloted this company by creativity and not by numbers. But we've, well, so we've had some hairy years, really hairy years. 2014, we, we, we nearly went off the tracks because really? exactly for that reason. We, we developed too many calibers at the same time and we just dried up all our cash. And that taught us a lesson and we're a little bit more careful now. But um, yeah, it's... Look, at the end of the day, I'm going to die too early, like everybody, even if it's in 40 years. And I just want to come out with what I've created. And that's the most important. That's a great answer. Uh, I wasn't quite expecting that, to be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had a little follow-up around but because, you know, when someone says you've created a caliber and you've created those movements, I think it's worth pointing out that you're not, not to sort of undermine the work you've done there, but you're not creating every wheel and every part. You're being very smart about how you how you do it. You're you're using pre-existing bits and pieces from here and there, and you're working um, you're working to develop the real, as far as I see it, the showstopper bits. So that innovative time display, or the you know the bit you know the the things that will really stun the customers. And I think what I find really 
I'd like to hear your answer on this is the HMX was your 10th anniversary piece. And it was a really uh, one of my favorite MBNF watches for a few reasons. Um, and it was powered by a Salita gear train, which I think a yep. lot of people would find surprising. Can you talk about what you, you know, maybe sort of the ecosystem of movement development and your part in that? Over the last 16 years, we will have come out with 20 calibers. Out of those 20 calibers, uh, now let's see. HM2, 3, 5, 8, X, five of them were actually modules on an existing movement. Four mm. were Girard Perigord movements and one was a Salita. The other 15 are fully new calibers. We have got oh. four complete uh, new regulating systems. You, um, so... You will see, for example, that a Legacy 2 with its two flying balance wheels, of course, has been created by us and uh, it's our movement. And then we can actually deconstruct it, reconstruct it and make it into an HM9. So, but mm-hmm. it is our proprietary um, developments, our balance wheels, our regulators, our gear trains, everything is ours. So uh, in, if I look at it, yes, at the beginning of the brand, I, I had to because I just didn't have the cash to, I couldn't develop full new movements. The first, well, the HM1 was, and then the HM4 was, um, and then the LM1. But then now, now everything we come out with since, well, actually since 2015, our 10th anniversary, if I'm not wrong, um, I'm getting old, I'm forgetting stuff, no, sure. um, I think is, is, is our own movement. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it's an important distinction uh to make, you know, given that there are new calibers, how how involved are you, you know, in 2021? Is it the same as 2015 when you were kind of designing these movements? Is it sort of a bigger team? Is it, you know, uh, external helps with your friends? How so, how hands on are you getting these yeah, days? Um, so the, the idea at MBNF is always starts as an idea. It's the contrary mm-hmm. of most brands, which will say, okay, which complication do we not have? And, oh, we need this complication in our lineup. But we never think that way. We, mm-hmm. uh, in a horological machine, it's, I'll think of a crazy concept. It's, I don't know, an airplane, a spaceship, or a car, or a bulldog. And, um, and in legacy machine, it's, uh, it's a tribute to the great master watchmakers. So we will reinterpret great calibers of the past in something completely amazing like the incredible perpetual calendar by Stephen McDonnell or the incredible um, Thunderdome by Eric Coudray, et cetera, et cetera. So from there onwards, um, whatever happens, the concepts is, is the beginning. And then yep. we, of course, create a movement which is absolutely at the same level of craziness and amazing as the watch itself. What is interesting is as long as we were only doing horological machines, most watch collectors didn't get it. They were referring to us as toys and other very degrading words. And um, as when we came out with legacy machines, it was like a decoding machine where suddenly people realized, wow, this is really incredible high-end watch making incredible Mm. artisanal finish, hand finish, hand engraving, beautiful rose gold chatonnet, et cetera, et cetera. And... I think that sort of told people, take us seriously, guys. It's not because when in horological machines we create these crazy things that it's not absolutely incredible watchmaking. Um, so the, the movement uh, is, in, is in, integral to the, the concept and it needs mm-hmm. to be incredibly well engineered. We've got, as I said now, five engineers in-house developing movements. Uh, mm-hmm. So, except for Eric Coudray's Thunderdome, uh, since 2015, since 2014, every single caliber is it was developed in house. Uh, I know, of course, Stephen McDonald's uh, Perpetual, and um, and so it's not that we want to do everything in house; is that we found incredible talents which decided to who, who decided to join us. And now, whenever it's outsourced, it's because that team of five doesn't have the talent required. So uh, if we work with Stephen, if we work with Eric, it's because internally we didn't have the knowledge. But we've got accumulated pretty amazing knowledge in, in these years. And, uh, and also, the more you experiment, the bolder you get. Because uh, just take a, take a bulldog. Yep. Flying balance wheel, 
uh, hours and minutes, uh, rotating domes, uh, vertical power reserve indicator, etc., etc. Super complex case. Well, if any brand, normal brand, had to create a product like that, it would probably take ten years. Yeah. But we were able to do it in three, two and a half, practically. Why? We developed the flying balance wheel for the legacy machines. We developed the the, the domes, hours and minutes for the frogs. We yep. developed the vertical power reserve for the LM1. Uh, the cases, I mean, gosh, we've developed insane cases. Nobody's ever come close to uh, over all these years. So even though it's incredibly complex, we had the knowledge. So that knowledge accumulates and it allows us to go faster when we develop something. And as I said, if any other brand had to create one of our pieces today, they would take three times the time we do. Uh, I don't think it's that we're better than anybody else. It's just that we've we've accumulated such knowledge with 20 calibers and 20 pieces over 16 years. It's like a giant toolbox. Yeah, it's it, indeed. I, f- I find that I find that really interesting because you kind of you there's an efficiency there with creating elements that you can apply, and that I guess that comes back to the overall design language of you know MBNF. What I actually want to ask you is, you know, you mentioned you have five engineers. Where do you find five engineers that can build calibers? Because, you know, 1.6 new movements per year on average feels like a lot. And, you know, we see big, big brands, you know, uh, Richemont brands, and they might come out with one or two calibers per year across, you know, a dozen or three dozen or four dozen different models. So to actually find the manpower to, to be designing movements like this, not sort of, you know, simple time only or you know a date display or something like that or a moon face like to to be coming up with the stuff that you're coming up with must be quite tricky where where do you find them well uh first of all they don't exist (laughs) meaning (laughs) there is nobody today which does what we do Mm -hmm. so um we we will uh we have taken on over the years our first r&d engineer joined us in 2012 nine years ago um somebody where we think he has uh, potential and uh, and it's a person who wants to experiment who wants to who's bored of the good old round boring movements i'm not saying they're not beautiful and i don't love them but it's i mean when you've been doing that your whole life you go crazy and um and so somebody um, and not everybody's got that mindset most people mm. look at us and they're like you're nuts most people are happy to create something which is in their comfort zone so you need an engineer who is ready to get out of his comfort zone. And usually it's interesting, we hire more or less young engineers, young meaning they've had, I'll say, six to 10 years of experience, but who also are great um, lovers of like, I don't know, one will be, um, how do you say, he's uh, he's redoing his own vintage car. So he's disassembling and reassembling his own car and redoing the gearbox. Those people are fantastic because they have got a thought process, which is incredibly, um, they they try and find solutions. They try and understand. They're not reproducing what they've been told to do. And that is one of the biggest issues of our industry today is everybody keeps on reproducing what he's been told he should be doing. And typically I'm an engineer by, uh, by training. I've got a master's in microtechnology engineering, uh, Admittedly, I wasn't by far the best, but um, I'm not a watchmaker. And a lot of my colleagues and friends in the industry have liked to point out that, yeah, MBNF Max, he's not a watchmaker, i.e. he's not serious, he's not great watchmaking. And um, of course, it's incredible watchmaking, but I had a really big chip on my shoulder for a decade. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not a watchmaker sort of guy. And uh, mm-hmm. until I realized there would never have been a legacy one if I'd been a watchmaker. Why? Because the first thing you're taught when you're a watchmaker is protect your balance wheel and escapement. And please have it at the highest um, uh, how do you say, uh, frequency so it's yep. easy to regulate. You must yep. be, you would, I would be burnt at the stake if as a watchmaker I decided to have a flying balance wheel on top of the base plate and it's a 14.2 millimeter balance wheel, we're oscillating at 18,000 instead of the good old 28,800. Uh, it's unthinkable for a watchmaker to do something like that today because it's not practical, it's not performant. Is that yeah. English? Performance is French. Yeah. Um, it, it's, so 
I have ideas, and then we've got these incredible engineers who are like, okay, <laughs> right, okay, so let's try and make this one work. Uh, instead of trying to to always just improve a little bit on what has already been done in the past. That's really interesting, but I wonder, do you, th- I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question because it's half formed in my mind. Do you think that's changing or is set to change? Because... 20 years ago when you were, you know, sort of creating, you know, Harry Winston, the Oprah series, and, Mm -hmm. you know, there was a a real groundswell of those great and innovative sort of independent watchmakers, that must have set some young minds alight who have now gone on to, you know, to study engineering and maybe are coming at it with a new perspective. Do you think there's a new generation of watch designers, engineers, and watch makers out there that have sort of been inspired by this school of watch creation that you've led? Clearly, I think we can say today that we and a few others have inspired a whole generation to think differently. Uh, We've allowed, and a lot of people have written to me or met me saying, you changed my life. Now I, I realize I can do something different. I don't have to be like everybody else. And I'm not the only one. I mean, look, we can credit, of course, Orverk. We can credit uh, Ulysse Nardin with The Freak. Uh, even, mm-hmm. in a way, Richard Mill with his RM1 when he came out with it 20 years ago. Um, there is a, there's a whole array of crazy creations which were starting at the beginning of the 2000s, which I think ignited something. But then most of them disappeared or, or went back into... Uh, normality and then of course we had the whole vintage era back to vintage and that has made everybody every creator's life complicated because everybody is just doing vintage now and um but i think there is an enormous opportunity today for younger or new creators doesn't have to be young in age just new creators because us independent creators we're all old fogies Look, I'm 54. I'm on the, one of the youngest ones. Uh, François Paul is 64. Uh, Philippe Dufour is over 70. Vianney is over 60. Kari is in his late 50s. Uh, Felix Baumgartner is still the youngest because he started when he was 22. So I think he's like 46 now. And um, there's this big gap of 15 years where there were no new creators. And then mm-hmm. uh, and then we've got ah, the great Red Chep who came at Red Chepi. Uh, came over and not only what he does is amazing but there was so nobody knew in the last decade that when he arrived everybody jumped on him like wow finally somebody who's new and I'm sure Mm. there is now possibilities for younger or new creators to come on the block because the market and the customers are waiting for the next generation oh that's a great answer it's uh, it's it's really interesting to think about what I want to um what I want to ask is sort of this is a one of my very first interactions with MBNF as a brand uh, in in person was, uh, I'm going to say it was 2015 or 2016. I was in, it happened to be in New York City, walking down a, a, a street in, in Soho, uh, and I and I bumped into uh, uh, an impromptu sort of what looked like a, a watch um, shoot, and I didn't realize it was a watch shoot at the time till I till I walked past and I saw you know the, they were just focusing on the watch, and it, and it turned out to be an MBNF and. The shoot turned out to be for Hodinkee. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and it was so. You know, the next day I found out that it was for a collaboration with Hodinkee. You're one of the first, if not the first, watch brand to collab with Hodinkee. Yep. What do you think of the success that they've had in the years since, specifically with their collaborations, which you know now are, are basically a sure thing? I'll start by explaining why we we, we did it. We, we were indeed the first watch brand to create a watch. Uh, with Hodinki or for Hodinki. And um, I remember that, uh, I can't remember which year it was, but Ben uh, Kleinray was probably seven, eight years ago or more. Um, when was it? 20... It would have been about 2011, 2012. Yeah, something like, I think 2014, mm. Ben came to see me in our little suite in, uh, in, in one of the hotels in Geneva doing SIHH. And, and I told him, look, I, I don't have any money to advertise with you. I will probably never have any money to advertise with you. Yep. Um, but I just want to say thank you. And we just come out with the Music Machine 3, which was the third collaboration with Roge of Music Boxes. I said, look, if you want, we will do a, an addition of five Music Machine 3s, uh, 
five or three, I can't even remember, just a little addition for you guys. And you can sell them. And with the margin, you keep the margin. And that's my way of saying thank you, because I honestly will never have money to advertise with you. And um, he looked at me like, music box at 20 grand? Are you sure? <laughs> and like, you know what? Look, we'll do the five pieces. If they don't sell, we'll sell them to our retailers. Don't, for, don't, don't worry. It's just my way of saying thank you. And he sold them in five days. It's the first time ever, we're not even talking a watch here, that he actually sold something as a collab with Hodinkee. And he called me mm. up behind. He said, wow. I mean, actually, we sold five music boxes of $20,000. That's incredible. Um, can we start thinking of a watch? And I was like, ooh, 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 that's a whole other step. And then I thought about it and I said, you know what? I told my team, the, they're going to have, they're going to be Hodinkee watches. It's going to happen. So we might as well be the first. And wow. uh, so I, I, I told Ben, what would you like? He said the LM101 and uh, he wanted in steel. We'd never done steel, uh, never done any steel in, in, in legacy machines in those years. And I said, okay. And I said, okay, well, we need to do at least 10 pieces uh, because otherwise it just doesn't make any uh, economical sense. Uh, but so if you want us to engrave Hodinkee on the case back, you're going to have to buy all 10. If you don't want to put Hodinkee on the case back, if you don't sell them, we can always sell them to our retailers or something like that. And he was very brave. He said, no, let's do this. We'll engrave Hodinkee on the back. And I'll always remember I was at Dubai Watch Week that year at the gala dinner and WhatsApp started arriving from Ben going, one sold. 20 minutes later, two sold. That was the launch. <laughs> Three sold. Fuck, four sold. <laughs> Good grief, five. And it, I, then I went to bed it was, it was late in Dubai. And, uh, and I woke up the next morning of him saying, Good grief, in five hours. It's not, it wasn't five minutes in those days. In five hours, we've sold 10 legacy machines at $52,000. And it was an eye opener, I think, as much for him as for me to think, wow, this is the beginning of a new era. So uh -huh. um, I just think Hodinkee has helped so many brands and so many retailers sell so many watches and I am just grateful for them because they helped us. Uh, and they didn't help us because they were making any money, because until I pitched them that, they were making zero with us. And uh, we never did anything after that, because once it's done, we're gonna, not going to redo another watch. Mm -hmm. And um, I think their enthusiasm of sharing and, and the reach they manage has helped our industry enormously. And I'm very happy for them that they can today become an incredibly uh, important retailer for most brands that they represent. For the moment, they don't represent MBNF, um, but I, I think they do a great job and they deserve all their success. 100% agree with that, obviously, and uh, that's a really interesting take on, you know, the sort of the learnings on both sides in that the early days there. One thing I think that is also remarkable about MBNF is how your visual style of watchmaking has in some ways evolved over the years. P part of it, I think, is perhaps your, you know, increasing technical capacity and, and bravery. Also, I think it might be the style is changing. How do you, how do you navigate, you know, the sort of what's cool and what's not cool, <laughs> you know, always going to be cool in three years time when your watch is ready to release? So uh, it's very easy. The only, the only reason I create anything is for myself. So I'm sorry, it's not very humble. It's incredibly <laughs> egocentric. Um, mm -hmm. Anything I create, I create to put on my wrist. And that's the whole creative process of MBNF is that it's the anti-marketing process. You don't, you start, John start thinking, oh, people want a watch which looks like a spaceship or, or anything like that. You, you know, I create what I want to see on my wrist. And whenever it comes out, it comes out. It's in fashion, not in fashion, it's probably not, because whatever we do is not in the mainstream. And, uh, and of course, if you look at MBNF in the last 16 years, you'll see a big evolution. You're very right. But that evolution is just my tastes evolving. And because mm -hmm. I don't want to do the same thing as before, and also my tastes are evolving. And I'll tell you honestly, if I look at my HM1, my original foundation piece today, sure. I look at it and I scratch my head going, what went wrong with you, dude? 
what, what were you thinking when you were creating that piece? But at the same time, I love that piece. I'm in love with it because it's the watch I created, which gave me the courage to create my brand, to create my story, to go f to set myself free. And when I created it, it was the best piece I'd ever created in my life. But 16 years later, I've evolved. I've moved on I'm like an artist who doesn't want to paint again the same paintings he was doing 16 years ago. His style changes. And that's what's interesting is that if you put all the MBNFs on a table, you will not see how the industry evolved. You'll see how my creative personality evolved. That's the only thing you're going to see. Um, it won't give you an inkling of an idea of what happened in the industry. I love that. I lo and I love to hear the sort of, you know, that that's the reason that you start a watch brand is to make watches that you want to wear. Um, do you think that there's one creation or one machine that MBNF has produced over, over that sort of 15, 16 years that really sums up the brand, like the, the essence of, of MBNF? Hmm. I don't think I've ever had that question. Wow. Um, congratulations. Uh, I, wow. Um, hmm. Oh, I have to think about that one. Which, one which sums up everything. It's going to be difficult mm -hmm. for one only reason. Yep. As I said before, the, the creative process of horological machines and legacy machines are completely different. Horological mm -hmm. machines come from the guts. They're my psychotherapy. Uh, legacy machines come from the brain. They're incredibly pragmatic, analytical uh, creations. And so they're very, bi it's, I'm very bipolar. So I don't think there's any specific piece which can resume both of them. Uh, I, will, I will say maybe an HM's, HM6, Space Pirate, which I think is the epitome Ooh. of what I'm wearing now as I'm talking, maybe that's why I'm thinking of it. Uh, it's the epitome of craziness, 3D, and at the same time, incredibly comfortable to wear, and and uh, which puts a smile on everybody's face when they see it. And uh, in legacy machines, uh, it's going to be a tie between Eric Coudre's Thunderdome and Stephen McDonald's uh, Perpetual Calendar. Um, and I choose on purpose two calibers we didn't develop because the brand is about synergies and working with people. Uh, and um, I, I will maybe have a, I'll go a little bit towards the perpetual calendar, just because even though I love Eric Coudre, Stephen McDonnell is in a complete different planet to any other human being I've ever met. And uh, <laughs> the story how we met, the story how he helped me save my company in 2007 and how I, basically went to save him in 2011 because he was in, in, in difficulty and he had the idea of the perpetual and we started on that. It's, it's a story of karma. It's a story of human beings. It's a story of genius, as he is a genius. Um, it's a story of a man who is a theology scholar who's never gone to watchmaking school and who basically reinvented the perpetual calendar movement and sold virtually every single issue which were in 150 years of perpetual calendars. And just that story makes it an incredible piece of watchmaking. That's, that sounds like it's the story in some ways, like I'm sure there's many stories like that across the history of MBNF, but that's an example of mm -hmm. the, the essence of the brand. I think that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, my next question is a little bit of a surprise. It's actually for Andy. Oh. Um, just to mix it up for a second, if you close oh. your eyes and imagine yeah. an MBNF, what what springs to mind for you? Uh, domed, lots of like domed crystal, um, okay, or spheres. Yeah, sure. Not a specific digital, watch then. Nah, digital displays, probably. Hmm. Hmm. I get the um, I get the Thunderbolt. That's the first one I think of. But that, that's probably got to do with when I sort of, I think it might be the first one I saw in real life. The Razzle Dazzle Thunderbolt was, I think, the first one. <laughs> I, I think I, the first one I saw was the Space Pirate, actually. Yeah. That's what I think of that sort of the quadrant, sort of the spheres and the, yeah. That's an interesting, interesting thought. Sorry about that, Max. Also, we'll, we'll, may, we'll get uh, back to you. <laughs> no, it's just interesting is that I think also um, a lot of people have discovered the brand through our clocks. Yeah. Huh. Uh, which actually are not our clocks, they're Lepe clocks. And so Lepe, mm. the oldest clockmaker in the world, and they're based in Switzerland. Um, they, uh, so we've done 
2012, collaborations with them, where we had the ideas designed to these crazy clocks and, um, and they engineer them and craft them and sell them. And I think that's also, um, I've discovered how many people have entered the brand first through our crazy 3D clocks. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, this is this is this is an honest thing, but it's on my list of you know when I have enough money is is to acquire one of those clocks. I, I just find them absolutely fascinating, and whenever you kind of get that crossover with um, art and timekeeping, you know it's it's a little bit easier to justify. And, and I had noticed, you know, you have some some really interesting um, you know names for your time art from Balthazar to T Rex to Grant, even Sherman. How how do you name them? And twenty twenty one, what do you think of the Andy? <laughs> Um, so it's funny because i've always felt that i was completely useless at naming uh, our creations it's a it's a it's a a complicated process which doesn't come often naturally um typically melchior and balthazar are a great story Mm -hmm. melchior was our first robot and balthazar Mm -hmm. the second or third and um that's related to my family the boosters were basically peasants from the german part of switzerland on the valensee the lake and um, my dad traced our family history uh, back to around 1450 and noticed that like for 500 years the boosters were called the elder son was always called melchior and his elder son would be balthazar and then melchior and balthazar for like 500 years (laughs) and my my grandfather was melchior and hated that name and called him had everybody call himself max and that's why when i was born my parents decided to call me max in honor of my grandfather i love the name melchior and so i was telling my wife when she was expecting and we didn't know if it was a girl or a boy if it was a boy i would like to call him melchior and she said over her friggin dead body and uh and so that was the end of anymore. So then I said, you, so you don't mind if I call my robot Melchior? I said, go ahead, knock yourself out. And, um, and so the second one was Balthazar. So th- there are there's so many links to the personal life. T-Rex, uh, of course, I mean, who, who as a child didn't play with dinosaurs, uh, boys at least, um, and, uh, and things like that. Sometimes we experimented with really lame names. I remember the HM5. I'd just gone to... a uh, an art museum in Bangkok, and I saw these really great names uh, on all these art pieces, uh, and which were phrases, because an art piece is usually a phrase, it's not a name. And um, so I told my team, we're going to call it On the Road Again. Oh. And everyone's like, oh, wow, that's so oh. cool. I don't think anybody in the history of humanity knows that this watch, this watch was called On the Road Again. It's just, oh, the Mura watch, because it looks like a Lamborghini Mura. Uh, and um, so we've done all sorts of things. Um, Double Trouble, yeah, Razzle Dazzle, because those were real names of um, nose art uh, American bombers. Uh, yeah. which when we were, I was looking in books. Uh, and, you know, I think Coco Chanel had a, a great saying. Again, I don't know if it's actually her, but it's attributed to her. Uh, she used to say, he who insists on his creativity, or he or she in this case, who insists on his or her creativity, has no memory. And you have to realize that whatever new thing you create, it comes from the influences you've had from everything you've noticed and saw and seen and, and uh, which seeps into you. And then you, it comes out, whatever comes in, comes out in a different format. And, um, and I am a, a perfect example of that. And whatever comes out of me is everything which I noticed but didn't realize uh, and it comes out, and maybe years later, I'll go, oh, actually, that probably came from here. Um, hmm. uh, what what did just happen recently? I I just, what did, what, what did I just come out, come out with? And somebody said, oh, it looks like R2T2. Ah, the, um, the power reserve indicator of uh, our LMX we just launched, our 10th anniversary sure. legacy machine. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. With the, with the with the blue lines around the sphere and everything, and somebody looks like us. Oh, it's good old R two T two, and I was like, what? And then I looked at it and I'm like, oh, you're right. But I never thought it was R two D two when I. Why why would you even call it R two D two? So when when I designed it, it was just I thought it was cool. 
Yep, that's uh, if, if Disney's lawyers ever listen to this, that's the story, and we're sticking to it. <laughs> there you go. So, and Andy will think about that. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a very diplomatic. Toss answer. it around, see if it sticks. But yeah, you know, maybe, maybe in ten years, I'll, I'll come out with something called the Andy, and everybody will go like, "Why did you call it the Andy?" I was like, "I don't know." But it's just <laughs> I won't forget the right so. name to call it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that you talk about sort of um, that Coco Chanel uh, quote because there's another sort of line that I'm not sure if it's an official motto, but it's it's certainly something that I, I associate with you when I see, you know, used on MBNF stuff. The creative adult is a child that survived. Yes. Where, what's What does that mean and how does that inform what you do? It's just, again, uh, my story. I was a super creative kid uh, who had no friends because he was super weird and had no social skills, super shy, uh, was the one who was bullied (laughs) every day at school, would go back to his Commodore 64 to program his little games. Now, that's super cool today, a kid who's programming his games. I can tell you that 40, 45 years ago, that was the Mm. summit of uncool. And um, and I just was creating stuff and I was weird. And, um, and then I tried to become normal because I was suffering a lot of not having any friends and no social life. And I became a very boring young Swiss adult. And I got a lot of friends. <laughs> but I was super bored. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I became incredibly boring and didn't create anything anymore. Became an engineer. I mean, uh, the most boring. And yeah, uh, and um, and then watchmaking more or less saved my life. And I think I got my mojo back in my early mid thirties, thanks to Harry Winston and meeting all these crazy independent watchmakers who were not at all fashionable or or uh, talked about as they are now. And these guys were all creating cool pieces, not because they thought the market existed, just because they they wanted to express themselves. And, uh, and so I think with MBNF, I've recaptured that little gawky kid. And I'm very mm-hmm. proud of that weird kid today. Um, for a very, very long time, I thought and said I had a very unhappy childhood, which always used to make my mom cry when she heard that. And, uh, and today I, I've, I've taken that weird, unhappy childhood and transformed it into a fantastic adulthood. Because now I don't give a damn of what people think. And I'm back to being that creative because I'm a kid now. Love that. Well, Max, thank you so much for joining us. How we, uh, how we like to wrap every show is we ask uh, our guests for recommendations on things that, you know, maybe they've been listening to or watching or, or reading or, or whatever that they might, that they think our audience might enjoy. Do you have any sort of recommendations? Doesn't have to be watch related. Uh, something, something weird. Killing the yeah, time sure. with and having um, fun with. Uh, Best book I read recently, Simon Sinek's uh, The Infinite Game. Incredible book. Simon Sinek is a great author. Uh, he'd written already, the, I think it's called The Power of Why. Um, yeah. And basically, um, it, it also explains why in our industry, some brands got hammered during COVID and others actually went super well like ours. And I didn't understand why until I read the book last summer. I was like, "Oh, that explains maybe why we're doing so well." Um, and he's in, and it's it's he explains why. And I'm not just talking of watchmaking here. Companies which started putting shareholders before their clients and their employees are basically destroying their brands and their companies. And those who always put their their clients and their teams way before their shareholders are the ones who will be there in the next 50 years. And uh, I think um, it's, it's a great read. Um, what else? What else did I um, read recently which I, um, I loved? Um, that was maybe before. Have you read... Um, what's his name? Uh, Mark, um, the founder of Netflix, uh, Mark, uh. Mark Randolph, founder of Netflix, wrote his biography uh, called That Will Never Work. <laughs> and his story of him trying to start Netflix and the first insane seven years of their history. I mean, any entrepreneur or somebody who wants to be an entrepreneur has to read that book. It's mind boggling. Uh, incredible read, incredible book. Fantastic, good recommendations. Well, we'll uh, we'll link all those up. Uh, Max, thank you so much for for joining Felix and I. With great pleasure. Thanks for the questions, and uh, I'll keep in mind the Andy. <laughs> Love it.
Really great to chat. Let's talk soon. Well, wow, that was a great chat. Uh, didn't really go the way I thought it would go, Felix. It, was it went very good honest. places, though. Yeah, very, like very wholesome in the end. I mean, I, I don't know why you'd expect it not to be wholesome with, with Max Musa, but <laughs> What a guy. What a guy. Makes me want an MBNF watch after having that <sighs> chat. I mean, yeah. We can only dare to dream. Well, I mean, I guess you, you you probably got to get one as part of the naming deal mm, in yeah. 2031. Licensing rights. Yeah, let's um, let's make sure the lawyers keep on top of that. Alrighty, well, thank you, Nomos Glasute, for sponsoring today's episode. We'll link up everything that we discussed. Yeah, and thank you very much, Max, from MBNF. It was a mm. trick chat to you, and we'll have to get him back. Fantastic. Well, you can email us, otthepodcast at gmail.com, or you can shoot us a DM on Instagram, ot.podcast. Yeah, and if you like OT, please remember to like, literally like it, subscribe yep. to it, tell your friends, tell your neighbours, tell anyone within your five kilometre radius. Um, mm. Yeah, positive reviews only. Yep, and tell Alexa to play it all day long. Smart. Mm. See you guys.